ADHD Rewired, episode 448. This is the podcast for those of us with really good intentions and a slightly wandering attention. I'm Eric Tivers. I'm a licensed clinical social worker by training and a coach by design. I'm your host, and I have ADHD. ADHD Rewired is a more than just a podcast. We are a community. We are wired for connection, and you are not alone. Go to ADHDRewired.com to learn how you can join us in our free and secret Facebook group. Get additional resources for every episode, including links to any resources we mentioned on today's show. You can support us on Patreon, sign up for our email newsletter. You can request podcast postcards to distribute to your clients and support groups. Learn all about our award-winning coaching and accountability groups. You can co-work with us in our adult study hall virtual membership community. You can do all of these things by going to our website at ADHDrewired.com. We know that starting is the hardest part, so let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of ADHD Rewired. Today's guest is Laura Key. Laura is the longtime editor and content creator, hosts the ADHD AHA podcast, and is the editorial director at Understood, a resource for millions of people with learning and thinking differences like ADHD and dyslexia. Laura co-leads the Understood Podcast Network and spearheaded the creation of the medium publication For By. She has two kids who keep her busy when she's not working and sometimes when she is working. Laura, welcome to ADHD Rewired. Thanks for having me, Eric. So it's uh, you were just telling me right before I hit record that uh, you are more, much more comfortable when you're on the other side of the mic being the interviewer. Oh, yeah. I much prefer to talk with people about their experiences. And it it might be because I have a a background in journalism. I went to journalism school and and also just I'm not always super comfortable talking about myself. So we'll see where this goes, Eric. Good luck to you. All right. Well, well, thank (laughs) you. Thank you. Okay, so let's first talk about your ADHD story. Let's do it. When did you learn that you had ADHD? Oh, so I got diagnosed with ADHD when I was 30. Um, I'm 40 now, so that was 10 years ago. But my ADHD diagnosis came about uh, two years after a different diagnosis that I received, which was for anxiety disorder. Um, It was a really interesting journey for me. I I had started to go to therapy in my mid-20s and my therapist was kind of hinting at the fact that, you know, I think that we may want to consider getting you on some anti-anxiety medication. And once I, you know, opened up to that, because I definitely was not at that time open to taking medication, it felt like cheating to Mm me. I'm sure a lot of people feel that way. When I finally opened up to taking the medication, Eric, I, it, it was fantastic because I was able to just know how I was feeling. It's not that it made me feel happy or down. It just, it was like, like I would call it like a metronome for my emotions. I knew when I was feeling down, I knew when I was feeling up and I could just, I just had more awareness. And then with that awareness came this feeling that, oh, something else is off. What's going on? Oh, I can't focus. Oh, I'm having trouble, you know, keeping up with deadlines at work. And you know, little by little, I, I started talking with my therapist and also my psychiatrist about it. And my psychiatrist one day, brilliant man, he just asked me one very, very specific question that mm-hmm. kind of blew my mind. He goes, Laura, when you're sitting in a coffee shop trying to write and edit your work, if someone makes a noise across the room that kind of bothers you, do you get like irrationally bothered and unable to get back to your work? And I was like, how the hell do you know that? Because it seems so specific. And yeah, he's like, let's get you an ADHD evaluation. Mm. And we moved on from there. Is that part of what you were uh, sharing with him that you were having a hard time focusing on your work? Yeah, it was that. And also talking about emotional regulation, which had gotten easier with the anti-anxiety medication but there was still something off, as I mentioned. I, I kind of felt like I, I couldn't control my emotions the way that I would have liked to. I felt like I would kind of fly off the handle. It's probably not a great term to use, but I, I, I would do that, you know, and I just, something something had to give, right? I just, I needed some support. Mm. So two years after you were diagnosed with, with anxiety and treated for anxiety, you got the ADHD diagnosis and uh, 
did you start medication treatment for ADHD right after the diagnosis? Um, I avoided it for a while for the same reason. I was like, I can't be on two medications. How about, what a cheater I would be, right? Like, how dare I let myself have tools um, to help me, um, you so know. You just need to try function. harder, right? Yeah, exactly. I could just work harder. I'm just being lazy. I, I'll just, I'll just exercise more and uh, I'll try better diet and I'll sleep more. And all of those things are great, but it wasn't enough. And eventually we started trying out, we tried non-stimulant medication and I wanted to start like that. And then eventually moved into taking a stimulant medication at a, at a low dose. And it just, it was just night and day. Mm. The fact, like the ability that I had. How would you that describe had, that, that first time on a stimulant medication for you? You know, it's so interesting because somebody asked me once, what does it feel like to take ADHD medication? And my, re- my response was, it doesn't feel like anything. I can feel it when I'm not taking it. Mm. So the feeling was the the difference, right? The the feeling that it's not like I have superpowers. I don't want people to think that like you take ADHD medication and you can conquer the world. It's just like, oh, I know what I need to do in, during the next I hour. I take my ADHD meds and I can actually wash the dish after I use yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. That's really it. And that's, it's it was the case for me for both medications. Like the feeling that I didn't really feel anything I didn't feel high. I didn't feel low. I just felt like regulated. That to me told me that this was the right medication at the right dose. And you said it helped you feel regulated. It was it also helping you with your um, emotional regulation? Yeah, it definitely was. I, um, it's not that I felt calmer. It's just that I, I, I was able to take a beat. You know, I, Pause could, to... I could pump the brakes. And mm. the, the it, it's interesting, Eric, because just realizing this now, I think I, I've kind of always been like... I've been like very well emotionally regulated in really hard situations, like situations that I'm prepared for my whole life, medication or not. Just like, okay, this is this is gonna be a really emotional moment. There's an illness or there's a hard thing going on in a relationship. But it was just the things that I couldn't anticipate that again kind of would like set me off. And it's those things that I didn't have a moment to pause and think about something before reacting. And that's where the ADHD medication came in and helped. How much of that do you think is around sort of that like mental flexibility that so many people with ADHD can struggle with is that ability to sort of shift our perspective or shift what was about to happen? Mm, I don't know. I've never thought about it that way. Um, I guess I've always, I always thought of myself as a flexible person. Um, I'm struggling with this one, Eric. Sorry. That's okay. Um, could you phrase the question in a different way? Um, Cause I guess what I was picking up on is when you were saying that there is, uh, like when you were taking the medication, it's like, like there, there's the medication wearing off right now. Um, we should probably tell the listeners that right before we started recording, we're both like, um, I think our meds are actually wearing off right now. So this should be interesting. Um, and I'm planning on leaving all of this in, by the way, because this is ADHD. Right. And, um, <laughs> and if, if everybody could see me right now, they would see that I I have to do interviews, whether I'm the interviewee or the interviewer standing up and I'm just like swaying my body. I just, I literally think better on my feet. So and that's great. That's um, good. You're doing things that you've learned that you know, work for you. Mm-hmm. So we were talking about emotional self-regulation and mental flexibility as sort of a part of that. And you were saying that you, you thought of yourself as someone who is, who is flexible. But then mm-hmm. when you were saying that, it was flexibility when it was something that is it like that, that you can control or it was hard to be yeah. flexible, you know, like, is it actually then flexibility? No, it, it, the word control, I think is really important there. Perfectionism is a big part mm. of my story as well. I think I went, my symptoms went unnoticed for so long because I pushed myself so hard and I was such a perfectionist and I, I would stay up all night doing my homework rather than risk risk in quotes, getting a B plus or an A minus. And it was like Mm -hmm. to the point of almost burning out. Right. Mm -hmm. So that inability to control perception of oneself, that inability to control those kinds of things that are in fact out of your control kind of drive me nuts for lack of a better term. When you, when you said a perfectionism, was that something that you felt was part of kind of how you did school and like, so way before your ADHD diagnosis. Yeah. And way before even being conscious of ADHD symptoms, for sure. It's interesting because I know for, for me, my perfectionism, I know was born during that first semester of college when I was diagnosed with ADHD. So I, I was diagnosed my sophomore year after I almost failed out. And once Mm -hmm. I started taking medication and I was like, oh, 
I can learn. I can, I can do this stuff. Right. Mm -hmm. And then for the first time in my life, I I got good grades and then I was expecting myself to do it again. And that's Mm -hmm. where the perfectionism was born. Right. And that you work. Yeah, it is. Perfectionism is not like when, when I hear people say, that like perfectionism as a as a strength trait. I was like, no, it is no, no, one no. of the most joy robbing forms of neurosis that there is. So like I I've been working on my own perfectionism for years and years and years. And I like I'll get into these these spaces where I'm like, oh, that is behind me. And then I'm working mm-hmm. on another project. Then I'm like, I've been working on the layout of this one slide for the last two hours. <laughs> help please um, <laughs> yeah I, I totally get it it's like you, you you create these more difficult expectations for yourself as as you go and like this version of yourself becomes more and more attainable and it's interesting I was interviewing someone on my sh- for my show the other day and he kept say, referring to himself as an underachiever and then in the next breath he would refer to he would say but I always want to do more I always want to do better and I pointed out to him, I'm like, those two statements seem really at odds. Like, don't you? And I really related to that moment. And he was like, oh, yeah, you're right. I'm like, I don't think underachievers are sitting around thinking about how they can be better all the time. You know, <laughs> they call themselves lazy. Like laziness is not thinking about yeah. all the things you need to do and not yeah. doing it. Exactly. Right? That's executive dysfunction. Exactly. And I don't honestly, Eric, know how I really made it through high school without crashing and burning. I mean, I was like basketball practice and games every day, volleyball practice games, AP classes, probably student council and any, and all that other BS and whatever. It sounds like you doing. had a lot of structure though. I had a lot of structure, but like, I feel like I barely slept and I was just like mm. spinning, spinning, spinning. And then it just, once I got to that mid twenties age and was like in first job, post-grad school, I was like, this is, I, it's just too much. So when you think about um, your sort of self-identity as someone who has both ADHD and anxiety, do you think about those separately or do you think about those as kind of an interwoven thing that that affects you the way it does? Oh, such a good question. I grapple with this all the time. They're just so intertangled. I mean, the comorbidity, as you know, is just, it's so high. And for me in particular, like that, entanglement um, is part of my ADHD story because it was this chicken and egg. Like, am I anxious because I can't focus or can I not focus because I'm anxious? What's happening here? And it, it's still really hard for me to, to tell the difference. Have there been any things that you have been able to identify to sort of distinguish between? Oh, um, let me think. To, to distinguish between ADHD and anxiety and the symptoms that come yeah, with it. Yeah, and I guess, and more specifically too, of like what you do about that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think as my awareness of my ADHD traits and symptoms and difficulties grows, it's easier for me. I think it's easier for me to spot the ADHD stuff, quote unquote, Mm -hmm. than the anxiety stuff. I'll notice when, you know, like right now I'm starting to like drift off. Right. And I'm like, that is, I mean, that's definitely my ADHD thing. The anxiety stuff, it it kind of feels like a little, like a little mini motor all the time. Like this kind of rumination thing. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I mean, what do you like, can you help me understand this? Cause I've been struggling with this for a long time. Like what's the difference? (laughs) I have issues around anxiety that that sort of wax and wane throughout the year. Mm -hmm. And I have my entire life. And there's definitely times where the anxiety is sort of external pressure based. Mm-hmm. And there's definitely times where I, I don't know what, there's no actual pressure, but I am feeling profoundly anxious right now. Like that, that mm-hmm. just uneasy feeling in your gut. And so a couple of things that I've identified for myself anyways, is if I am not exercising or not, not exercising enough, one of the things I actually discovered just in the, in the last like year was like, I cannot have a second cup of anything caffeinated if I did not exercise. Mm. Like, if, if I exercise, I can be okay with that because it sort of like burns it for me. Mm-hmm. But if I, had a, if I had a second cup of coffee or I had a, you know, I'm like, I want to move for a chai tea today after, you know, on the way to work. Like, that I will be sitting at my desk just feeling like a nervous wreck, mm-hmm. right? And so I, so yeah. I did discover that I did definitely have that... Um, seasonal affective disorder and so mm. anxiety and depression kind of go hand in hand with that. Right. So, yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's gone through different periods. I remember when I was in college, after I was diagnosed with uh, ADHD and was taking medication, I was also getting a lot of anxiety. And so I was prescribed some anxiety medication 
And I like just very vividly remember like, oh, this is totally helps the anxiety because now I just don't really give a shit about anything. So oh. <laughs> like, it was, it was like, it was too much. It was, it made me chill mm-hmm. too much. Right. And so I was like, yeah, oh, you could I, feel it. Yes. Right? Yes. I'm like, oh, I am, I am relaxed as hell right now. Right. Which is, <laughs> you know, I, I mean, I kind of felt high. Right, which isn't, mm-hmm. I don't think is the point of no. our anxiety medication. It's just supposed to take the the edge off. And now I take a so I take um, my ADHD meds. I take um, uh, the, um, you know the the meds are wearing off, and I can't think of the med. Uh, my Deus, <laughs> and mm-hmm. then I take Wellbutrin mm-hmm. on that for a couple of years, and I have a so a PRN sort of an as needed, um, a, a medication that I always forget the name of. I'm looking at my drawer. Um, <laughs> Lorazepam, which I will take oh, yeah. for sleep every once in a while, or if I'm having really high uh, anxiety. I don't even think I've taken that thing in, in a couple months. <laughs> so yeah, but that's, you know, it's part of this ADHD picture. Like, you know, I have to use the expression like ADHD often comes with friends, right? Oh and yes, the, I, I've heard you say that. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> right, and it's like, these aren't our, these aren't friends that we necessarily want to have, but they're around. And so we have to mm-hmm. learn how to, how to manage uh, those. So what I want to actually do right now is take a really quick break and uh, and we will come right back. And I want to hear some of the stories that you've heard when you've been interviewing the guests on your podcast that had that ADHD aha. So we will be right back. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from ARC. ARC is ADHD Rewired Coaching. Learn more at coachingrewired.com. Every season, our members learn and experiment with different tools and methods that work with their ADHD. They become more aware of where they're really spending their time. They learn how to create actionable to-do lists that reflect their intentions and more. Our fall season of coaching and accountability groups are now full, which means we are opening up our interest list for our winter season. So go to coachingrewired.com to get your name added to our interest list. Because there, you'll be able to get notified when our first registration event for our next season of coaching groups will be. If there's one promise we make, it's that you will still have ADHD by the end of our 10-week intensive coaching program. But support doesn't end after those 10 weeks. Our members have continued their personal growth journeys with other members who have already gone through our coaching groups in our alumni community. Because maintenance is hard and sometimes we need others who truly understand us to remind us that we can do hard things. Whether it's revisiting our to-do lists, remembering our successes, or remembering the strategies we've learned, we don't have to do any of that alone. Find out more and get your name added to our winter interest list to join us for our winter season of coaching and accountability groups starting in January of 2023 by going to coachingrewired.com. Once you've added your name, we'll let you know when our kickoff registration event will be. Come grow with us and kick off your new year and make it your best year yet. That's coachingrewired.com. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from our patrons over at ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. If you love what you hear on this podcast every week and you find value in this show, consider becoming a patron where you can also find some extra perks. We have perks of $5, $10, and $25 a month, all of which include ad-free episodes of this show. At the highest level, at $25 a month, you could join me for our monthly coaching call. Usually our monthly coaching calls are every fourth Tuesday of the month at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 p.m. Eastern. But this month only, in September, we are moving it to Thursday, September 29th, at the same time, at 1 p.m. Pacific, 4 Eastern. Then, after this month, we'll go back to our regular monthly call time, which means our October monthly coaching call will be on Tuesday, October 25th. Maybe you're thinking ahead about ADHD Awareness Month for October. A great way to do that is to become a patron. Consider becoming a patron to support our work if you learn something new every week. Thank you to all of our patrons who give over at ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. We so genuinely appreciate all of your support. Become a patron today. Go to ADHDrewired.com slash Patreon. And thanks.
right, we are back with Laura Key from the ADHD AHA podcast. She's also the editorial director of Understood uh, Podcast Network there. So before we get into the stories that you've heard on your podcast, what made you think about doing podcasting and then doing a whole <laughs> podcast network? I got tricked into it. and no, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> there's, always, there's always a grain of well, truth idea, in, in those jokes. Yeah. <laughs> well, we'll get there. We'll get there. The um, So we had launched a podcast a few years ago at Understood called In It, which is, it continues to be uh, a podcast uh, for parents of kids who learn and think differently. So it's a parenting show and it's seen a lot of success. It's a wonderful show. Recommend folks, especially parents, of kids with ADHD, who maybe your listeners check it out. But, you know, following that, we realized there are so many other kind of stages in people's journeys or different types of people we can talk to through podcasts. We provide so much information on our website, but it's really hard to bring emotion through written content and sometimes mm-hmm. even through pre-recorded video content, right? There's nothing like sharing personal stories to help people change their attitudes about things. At least that's how I feel. And we put together a pitch and we said, we want to launch a whole network and we want to see where it goes. And one of those shows in our network is ADHD AHA, which I host. The idea wasn't originally for me to host. It was just, I was part of the brainstorming process. And we have some amazing folks on our team who, I think what happened, Eric, was I was telling them about my own AHA moment. And so an AHA moment, as we define it, is that moment when it finally clicks that Mm -hmm. you have ADHD or sometimes it comes post-diagnosis, like you realize, oh, ADHD is really real. Like you maybe were like kind of sweeping it under the rug a little bit. Now you're, oh, I'm going to pay attention to this. And my aha moment fell into that latter category when I was um, a few years after my diagnosis, so in my early 30s, I went back to my parents' house in Ohio and I used to journal all the time. And I found my boxes of journals and I was like, oh, this will be a fun little trip down memory lane or a terrifying one. And, and I opened up these journals from as early as when I was 13. And it was almost creepy, Eric. I had scribbled all over the pages the word focus and bubble letters and little letters and big, like all over oh, page wow. after page. So I was trying to focus on my thoughts and write because I always wanted to be a writer and I couldn't focus. And I was writing the word focus. I had no awareness of ADHD symptoms. So, but the discovery of those journals post-diagnosis was like, oh shit, this has been affecting me my whole life. And I just haven't really paid attention to it. So I'm sharing that story with some team members. I, th- I think it was somebody else who came up with the, the term ADHD aha. And that's what we do. We explore aha moments with folks. So what have been some of the the most uh, impactful ahas that you've heard as a host? They're all so impactful in different ways, as you know. I sure. mean, this is what you do as well. And I'm sure each guest resonates with you on a different, le- different level. But, well, you know, it's interesting. We approach each episode through the lens of a symptom because we talk with all different kinds of people. We talk with parents. We talk with individuals, men, women people from different parts of the country, people with different backgrounds. But the thing that I feel like really draws listeners in is the the connection to the symptom. Like if you see an episode called like ADHD and boredom and you're like, oh, I have ADHD and I'm really bored all the time. I don't care if this person doesn't sound like me or isn't from where I'm from. I'm going to find something useful in this story. And so like, that's kind of the entry point to all the, the episodes. And I mean, there was one on recently with a woman named Kai Kai is a comedian. And when I pre-interviewed her, she was like, you know, I just, I just always thought I just had a bad personality Mm. and I'm talking with her. I'm like, you're hilarious. What are you talking about? We get into the show and she's just cracking me up the whole time. And we played an impromptu game show where I went through (laughs) all these different, I went through all these different scenarios where like, if you're talking with like it, basically an ADHD symptom and how that could make you a bad friend. It was kind of like reverse psychology. It was really bad actually in hindsight, but she she was able to like take these stories about like be procrastinating and cutting people off and interrupting. And like through that kind of cathartic laughter about symptoms and how they can make people maybe feel certain things about you. We came to this like really beautiful moment of like, your personality is amazing. You don't have a bad personality. You're struggling with executive function. And I'm not an expert. Like I don't diagnose anybody, but just people just come to it on their own a lot of times through the show, which has been really cool. I Um, I always love those moments when, when I'm interviewing someone and the response to a question is, I never thought about it that way before. Mm-hmm. Or like, I, I love mm-hmm. that. And you can see the wheels sort of spinning and just giving that that new perspective or a different perspective that just helps clarify. You know, I I think this week we came out with the 440th 
episode. And so sometimes when I'm doing the- Congratulations. <laughs> thank you. Sometimes when I'm doing pre-interviews, when I talk to people, I'm like, oh, I'm sure you've already had stuff on this in the podcast. I'm like, yes, and nobody has told it quite the way you are because, mm-hmm. you know, we can have the same topic discussed hundreds of times. But it's a little bit of a different flavor each time. Yeah. And one flavor might not resonate as much as another flavor. And so I think that even if we are repeating some of the same ideas, everyone has their own story. And I think that's one of the most powerful things about sort of long form content that we can do in podcasting mm-hmm. is, you know, it's through story that we see ourselves in others. So it's, you know, we're not looking at a symptom checklist. We are, you know, it's it's even in the the meta conversation, the losing track of where we were in the conversation. And mm-hmm. people, I, I get a lot of people who tell me like they love that I leave that stuff in because they can yeah. hear themselves in it, right? And it's like, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, you're so right. Especially like the way that we approach it through like a symptom first thing. It sounds like it could get kind of repetitive, but it's those unique flavors of people's stories. Like so many folks on my show talk about impulsivity and their impulsiveness. And one of the the young people I interviewed on the show, I think his name is Chris. Yeah, Chris. And he was so soft-spoken and he just got to this place where he was like, you know, I I seem calm on the outside, but on the inside, I feel like I'm a volcano. Mm. And it was just this really powerful moment because he just seemed really shy. And then after he said that, he just opened up Mm. and he shared how he's impulsive and how other people don't always notice it. Um, Yeah, we always we always cry a little bit on the show and we try to we try to keep it fun, too. So we, had, we, had, we had someone today in uh, in one of my uh, my coaching groups who is a um, he's a he's an actor and he was saying you know I'm, I'm very outgoing and kind of bubbly and then I had this realization I actually don't like people. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's nice. like we, we we put on these masks and sometimes we realize like oh this is a mask we're putting on like sometimes yeah. we we put the mask on so much and so yeah. often that it kind of becomes mm-hmm. who we are until we kind of have that moment yeah. where, wait a minute, this actually isn't. Totally, totally. I um, <laughs> One of the episodes I'm thinking about right now is, um, his name was Kevin. Oh yeah, amazing Kevin. And he wasn't told about, he was diagnosed as a kid and he didn't find out that he had it until he was in his early 20s mm. when he was at Disneyland or Disney World with his mom and his nephew. And his nephew had been diagnosed with ADHD and was running around and was being kind of that classic presentation, quote unquote, classic presentation of hyperactivity. Mm-hmm. His mom was like, oh, you have that too. You have ADHD too. And he's like, what are you talking about? It's like, I just never told you. I didn't think you needed to know. That's heartbreaking. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but he just like, he, he is so lighthearted and amazing and he kind of laughed about it. And as the conversation went on, he's like, yeah, but I don't think it really affects me. And then eventually he was like, oh yeah, you're right. It really affects me. <laughs> it's not like I was trying to convince him that things were hard. It's just, it was clear to me through the course of the conversation. And that math. Did, did you just give you him that, that kind of sort of silence and space to just say that without a reframe? Because sometimes it's the silence that helps someone actually realize that what they just said, they're full of it. Yeah, yeah. I, I, maybe I did. I'm sometimes I'm overly chatty. I don't always have a lot of great si- silences, but yeah. <laughs> so let me ask you this. How has doing this work and talking to other people with ADHD and working for, for understood, how has that impacted your own ADHD? Oh, I mean, first of all, it, it's, I'm part of a built-in community at my job, number one at understood.org. And all the, there's so many folks who work there who have ADHD and or learning disabilities. And if they don't, I mean, we're all immersed in all of this constant feedback from either the experts who we work with, from whom we get to learn all this amazing stuff. But most importantly, perhaps, is like the community feedback that we get. And that's what I get also from the show. And it just makes me feel, if I'm really, really honest, I don't think I ever, I never really intended or wanted to be a representative of ADHD. It wasn't like in the plans for me. And so I I kind of, I was hesitant to even host the show and I I may be even a little bit embarrassed. Like I'm going to be sharing a lot of stuff about myself. Right. And then little by little, the emails start coming in and I see you smiling. So I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, oh, this actually made a difference. Mm -hmm. This this helped people to hear the story. And I know that sounds cheesy, but it it really, I mean, it's probably the reason that I keep doing it. It's, Um, It's the reason I keep doing it. You know, it's yeah. been, you know, coming up on almost eight years of, of doing this podcast. I remember yeah. very, very early on, um, you know, because I had a, a clinical therapy practice and like, even on my website, it was very like, it was more of a, 
get to read between the lines on some of the stuff that I had to be able to, to uh, gather that I had ADHD. And so when I, when I did the podcast, I was like, oh man, I'm like, I, I'm like really putting myself out there. Right. Mm-hmm. And I remember getting an email from uh, someone, maybe episode seven, eight, something like that. And the email, it was a, just a couple of sentences. And one of the sentences was, thank you so much for putting out this email. It takes a lot of balls to put out what you're doing. Yeah. And I was like, oh no, what did I put out? What did I say? <laughs> and, but then, you know, I got more and more of these kinds of emails. And then um, I know I've shared this on the podcast before, but it was an episode, it was episode 47 of my podcast. So it was- Wow, my, good my, memory, my, by the way. Well, <laughs> it's public because I, I still get emails about this particular episode. So okay. I was like in so deep in sort of perfectionism land of I was gearing up. I think it was like for my second or third launch for my coaching groups. And I was just like completely determined we're going to fill these groups up. And so I'm doing like I'm studying all this marketing stuff to do this, the, you know, the whole like launch sequence and everything, which it's a ton of work. I was also giving a presentation to a, a school district on that day. And I even knew at the time, I'm like, this is going to conflict with this launch. Like, but they're paying me for this. So I'm going to go do this, this talk. So I was so focused on like, all right, like I haven't missed a week yet. I'm, you know, episode 46. I'm almost at episode 50. I, I can't miss this week. And I'm going <laughs> into, I think it was my, at the time I released episodes on Monday and my editor needed the episodes by Friday morning and I'm going Thursday night and I'm like, I don't have an episode. So I grab my recorder on my way to the talk and just start talking into the mic, into the recorder while driving to the talk. Oh my god! I was like that week, I was up until like two in the morning every night. Like my brain was not in the best of spots. Like I don't think I could like finish a thought. And I I was like, I don't think I should release this. This sounds really unprofessional. Like my ADHD she is raging on this episode. Right. (laughs) And like, and I had it queued up and I was like, went back onto the, the media host and I would like almost unpublished it. Like, I'm like, ah, I don't think I should release this. And then I did, I released it. And to this day, it is still probably the, I get more emails and, and uh, contacts from people thanking me for releasing that episode. I, I refer to it sometimes as an auditory fMRI of ADHD. Because it's, <laughs> I had someone tell me that they thanked me for releasing it because they were beginning to wonder if I actually had ADHD, which by the way, brought me to tears that email, Aww. right? Because wow. it's like, we, we sometimes, when we take a step back and sort of see how we're doing and when we're, we realize, oh, we're actually not screwing everything up, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's and like, that substance oh. and relatability can be so much more important than the polish, right? Yes. Yeah. And that's, and that's been such a helpful thing as for my own ADHD, it was really, um, from really that episode on was a huge turning point in my own perfectionism. I was like, oh, people just want me to be real. And like, it's okay that like, if I'm sometimes a little off my game or I'm a little tangential um, or if I, you know, occasionally interrupt or we have a, a topic on a podcast that we never really talk about that topic. Um <laughs> You know, because people are like, yeah, this is relatable. Like, these are my people, right? And I think yeah. that, I think community is so important. But, um, you know, kind of going back to the, the the question, I'm just watching my own ADHD right now in my monologue. I love it. I'm <laughs> embracing it. You're among um, friends. <laughs> you know, and it's just like not having to mask helps mm-hmm. all of my ADHD symptoms, Right. When I don't have to masquerade as normal, when I don't have to put on the show of I got all my shit together because I don't, right? And I'm just mm-hmm. showing up as the as the best self that I can, right? And knowing that 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 best self is going to change day to day, mm-hmm. right? It's something about the it takes that pressure off of like how am I found out because I'm I'm already found out, so it's nothing yeah. I'm trying to hide. Yeah, I, right? I, I totally relate. I mean, the show has been like a release valve mm-hmm. for me. I mean, it adds a certain amount of stress, like with like scheduling and whatnot, but like the act of doing it, except for the first few episodes. And I, I was like about to pee my pants. Well, for those those, those first so few are supposed to be awful, right? I mean, yeah, <laughs> yeah. They turned out well because we have a, we have an amazing producer and, and you know, um, but yeah, I mean, but now I, I really, really look forward to going into an interview. And one of my favorite things to say to people before we go in, I'm just like, you don't have to prepare anything to show up. Yeah, I got you. Yeah. We're going to have fun, which is kind of what you do. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> every once in a while, I think I was telling you this during the pre-interview, every once in a while, I'll get people who will email me like, can you send me the questions? 
I was like, that's, that's cute. Wait, but Eric, I think I might've done that too, oh, yeah, because yeah. I was so nervous. <laughs> actually, as I was setting that up, I, it actually was crossing my mind. No, you oh. should, but look, that's my perfectionism anxiety. <laughs> like I would never, it's because me, I'm, I'm not worried about you. I'm like, I'm worried about how I'd be perceived. Right. But like for my own show, I would, know, I'd be like, well, you don't need the questions. <laughs> I'm so glad you brought that up because I was actually really surprised that you sent me an email asking you for questions. I, I didn't like, know what you wanted to say. I, I don't know. I just want to put, you know, my best foot forward, Eric. <laughs> Trying to represent my brand well, not my personal brand, my organization well, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I'm glad that's out in the open though, because that needed to be stated. That was like, see, you were asking before, what's anxiety versus ADHD? That was my anxiety. Mm, mm. Right. So yeah. there's there, I spotted one. We finally came back to it. That that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think it's such a, a really good point for us to take a uh, one more quick break. Um, when we come back, I want to talk a little bit about some of your other roles as one being a parent. We will be right back. Support for ADHD Rewired comes from Adult Study Hall at adultstudyhall.com, the virtual co-working community and body doubling community where people with ADHD are working together to get things done. From our weekly guided sessions, also known as Adult Study Hall Plus or ASH Plus, to our 24-7 drop-in room, there are plenty of ways that you can utilize the power of real-time accountability to get your to-dos from do to done. It's only $19.99 a month and it is free for the first week to try. Go to adultstudyhall.com to learn more about our ASH Plus sessions and everything else that we are offering in Adult Study Hall. Come work with us at adultstudyhall.com. If you enjoyed this podcast and want to stay up to date with our show notes and weekly episodes, then make sure you subscribe to ADHD Rewired by either going to ADHDrewired.com slash podcast or by hitting the subscribe or follow button in your favorite podcast player. And if you love this show, don't forget to leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast player if that app allows. If you are one of those probably many, many people who keep thinking and meaning to leave a review, would you please do it? It's really helpful for us. Then be sure to check out our other shows on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network by going to ADHDrewired.com slash podcast network. We have Hacking Your ADHD with Will Curb, ADHD Essentials with Brendan Mahan, and ADHD Diversified with MJ Siemens. And coming soon, coaches Kristen Martz and Coach Kat Hoyer, they are both going to be starting a podcast in the months to come. You will have more information about that as it develops. You can also join me and the rest of the ADHD Rewire team for our monthly live Q&A every second Tuesday of the month at 10.30 a.m. Pacific, 1.30 p.m. Eastern. The best way to join us is by going to ADHDrewire.com slash events to register for our monthly live Q&A so you can interact with us and have a chance to ask your questions live. Find this podcast and all of our shows by going to ADHDrewired.com and clicking on the podcast tab at the top of the page. And if you want to join our monthly Q&As, click on the events tab at the top of the page so you can join us every month. That's ADHDrewired.com. And thanks for listening. And we are back. I just wanted to share with listeners uh, during the break. We were, we were grabbing a sip of water, and Laura told me that she that her daughter has the same water bottle, and I told her that I had lost this water bottle for about a week, and it was turned out it was actually on my desk for the entire week. I just, you know, <laughs> do you have counter blindness? I have what I call it counter blindness, where like I I know I'm looking for a th- like the thing, and I'm looking right at it, but it, my brain is not register the. That I'm looking at it. I can't. Eric. Yes, Eric, I do. I like my daughter, my seven year old daughter points out to me constantly that I, she's like, Mom, you lose your phone every day. She's like, it's right there. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> but I will run up and down the stairs in my house and I will like, I'll get my heart rate going. It's like my best exercise is looking for my phone. It's just sitting do you have right a there. Smartwatch or tile? I do. I'm just not wearing it right now. <laughs> at least once a day, I, I tell my, my, uh, um, Apple Watch, or I'm asking Apple Watch, where's my phone? At least once a day. <laughs> I have an Android watch, so I don't know if it'll do that. The tile? I don't know what you're saying. What are these words you're saying to me? I just don't know. Tile. <laughs> I have it in my wallet, right? Like, All right, I, writing I, it down. At least once a week, I'll get a text message about 30 seconds after I leave my house. 
letting me know that I left my wallet at home. Oh dear. Oh dear. Yeah. This is the reason why we have an electronic lock on the door though. So it, assuming that we don't leave our phone at home, we can unlock the door from our phones if we need to. Just hopefully the internet doesn't go down. Oh my gosh, I can't. (laughs) (laughs) I think we found an anxiety trigger. They've lost the internet. (laughs) Okay, so how does your ADHD show up as a parent? Oh, um, I overly anticipate all of the steps needed to quote unquote complete the day because I'm always like I can get so hyper-focused on something that I, I can be forgetful about my parenting duties. So I'm, it's, it's interesting, like, and this may be some anxiety and perfectionism hold up in it as well, but you know, all that, like all the parenting websites will say, you know, if you're having trouble getting out the door in the morning, prep everything the night before and this and that, I, I do that. And then some, I'm like prepping things to the point, cause I'm so afraid I'll forget something that my child needs prepping to the point that sometimes I'm not as present with them as I would like to be. Mm. So I'm so worried about being disorganized for them that I'm, I, I think I might be perceived as the, as, you know, just, I'm always there and we have a lot of fun, but I'm just like, yeah, but before we sit down, I got, I got to do this one thing. I got to do this one thing. You know, so I'm working on that. I am. And um, yeah, it's actually, that was kind of hard for me to admit, but you should keep that in the show. <laughs> parenting is for me one of the harder roles in terms mm-hmm. of ADHD like so I think in some ways it, it plays well because I can be very playful and kind of spontaneous mm-hmm. and um, kind of go with the flow but on the on the other hand where it for me because my my son who's been on the podcast before um, oh. who is uh, you know is highly gifted with ADHD and autism like his his verbal just rate is so fast and he's in like his ideas he keeps moving out and, and I need a little bit of time to process what he's saying and so it's like I get overwhelmed I mm-hmm. you know and he's a major homebody and I'm also like kind of a homebody but I also want to get him out to do more things and so if I have a hard time transitioning anyways and he's resistant to going out to do stuff like it's just like oh, okay well we can stay in mm-hmm. right mm-hmm. and and yeah. stuff like plan- like his birthday is uh is next weekend um i'm actually uh <laughs> so i'm going to i'm going to see fish the, the band um on his birthday <laughs> i'm going to be out of town for the weekend is he going with you no no oh. <laughs> um uh we, we did talk about it he but um i still haven't planned anything for his birthday mm. I'm, I'm mm. whispering, even though he's not even anywhere in the building. I don't know why. It's it's because I feel like bad that I haven't done anything yet. I, I hear you, Eric, but you're going to figure it out. Let me tell you a little story, if that's all right. <laughs> Please. <laughs> when this is, I think this might be uh, an example of like an ADHD related strength, potentially. Okay. When we were like at the very beginning of the pandemic, everything, like schools weren't even open with masks and whatnot. My daughter was about to turn five and we had planned her birthday party for her. And obviously we had to cancel everything. And she was just so, so down. And I was feeling the same way. I'm like, what am I going to do? What am I going to do for her? I have no idea. And I was like, Cecilia, put on your frozen dress or your, and put on, put on all the regalia, you know, and let's just, let's just take a walk. Let's just take a walk around. And I texted as many neighbors whose numbers I had. And I was like, we're going around the block for my daughter's birthday. Could you just like poke your head out and wave to us and like cheer for us as we go? Aww. And we, I brought I brought pots and pans and I was just banging on them saying, it's her birthday. It's her oh, birthday. Yeah, and she, I love that. that was like, to her, that was like the biggest party she could ever have. She felt like a princess walking around the block and getting cheered that. for. And that was I like an that. on the fly thing. I'm really... It, I, I wish that my ADHD would surface more in ways like that, but that is uh, something that I was proud of and, and really happy to have done for her. And she seemed really happy. So last, last uh, February, I, uh, my, my girlfriend and I, we went uh, to Mexico for a week to see fish. And on the last day when we're ready to go back to uh, the, the airport, um, you know, that people from the hotel, they, they try to sell you on these timeshares and all that. So earlier that day, I was, you know, sitting by the pool thinking like, I want to bring Gibson. Like, I think he would really like this kind of thing. And I'm like, and I, I just really want to make sure I, I'm doing more vacation because it's something that I've been kind of neglecting for the last decade. And so yeah. we're, we're, we're heading out and this uh, person from the hotel 
is trying to sell me on this thing. And I'm just like, I'm not in Java. And he said something that like, I'm like, wait, what? So he said he can come back for five days for $500 and then he actually take that $500 and use it for towards resort credit. And I'm like, okay, so what's the catch? He's like, well, there's a two hour presentation for a timeshare that you would need to, to, it's like two hours. I'm like, I'm, I'm stubborn. I can plug my ears. <laughs> and uh, um, so I did, I, cause I had, it wasn't a completely impulsive purchase. Because I had been thinking about wanting to take him there and I wanted to do more vacations. And I was like, oh, well, this seems to cross that, you know, off. So that is as far as I've taken it. I like, I have his birth certificate. I need to get him a passport, which Oof. requires planning because then I need to, my ex and I need to go <laughs> do that together because both of our signatures need to be on there. And I'm just like, oh my God, like, cause he want all he wants is to go on a plane. Like he's like, you told me that my 10th birthday, I would go on a plane. I'm like, I know I did, but we also, I didn't know we were going to have a global pandemic. Right? <laughs> Aww. Yeah. Um, so I've been starting to sort of tease a little bit like, well, we, there might be something that we're, uh, we might need to go somewhere where we need to get on an airplane. So he's excited about that. But outside Aww. of that, I still have so much planning to do around that. And so that's Ugh. that's the kind of stuff where my my ADHD and parenting becomes challenging is just the, yeah. the logistics and the planning and the like not thinking on the weekend. What do I want to do this mm-hmm. weekend? Yeah, I actually really struggle with those weekend yeah. moments though. It really bothers. I need the structure. Yeah, I, I actually, I think I'm a better mom during the weekdays, which maybe sounds counterintuitive, but like... I'm like the best at bedtime. I'm so good at it in yeah. terms of just like quality time and efficiency, Eric. I got because it's like the structure, right? Breakfast time, hanging out, do like a good night walk. We're doing all these things. The weekend comes around, and I'm just like, I, I get, I get really anxious, mm. um, and I, the lack of structure kind of bothers me. And then I get anxious about the fact that I'm anxious because I'm like, just be oh, a free spirit that. and just oh, be I cool with it. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Are there any interviews that you're excited about coming up? I'm excited about um, the one I actually referenced earlier, the interview I referenced earlier about um, this guy, Kenny. He's a creative director. He was diagnosed in the 80s with ADHD, and he's kind of been telling himself that he is an underachiever most of his life, and yet at the same time is always wanting to do more and do better. And we got to talk a little bit about punk rock music oh, and fun. how it's great for people with ADHD, get the, the short songs and whatnot. And so that was fun as well. Oh, that's so interesting. I, how do you deal with fish? Like the songs are so long. I lo- and that's why I said <laughs> it's so interesting because I love like the 20 plus minute jams that are <gasps> like, because it's not repetitive. It's like it, it keeps going somewhere else. Right. And it's oh, like when you have like, some of their, their longer jams that have like, there was, oh, what song was it there? I was listening to, it was on Sirius XM. Um, and sometimes they'll interview different band members. I think it was one of the band members saying that that one of their songs was like 33 different parts to this one song. And it's just like, <laughs> wow. it's as a musician, like it's, I, I just fascinated by the musicianship of it. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. Like very jazz, like, and that way it kind of goes yeah, where it goes. And experimental yeah. and very like, and very playful. And that's what I love. Like, Huh. Yeah, so they'll they'll do all kinds of really weird, goofy stuff, which I just love. Uh, so my, I think my musical tastes surface in a different vis a vis my ADHD. They surface in a different way. I'm like, I want that structured song, Got right? It. And like, and I, I remember when I I went to go see Sonic Youth when I was oh, nice. in my early 20s, and they were doing all this experimental kind of plucking on the guitars, and it was just it was like bow. And I'm like, come on, let's let's move it along. Come on. Why why is the song taking? I know what song this is. I want to hear it. This is my favorite song, but you're making that take too long. <laughs> or the fish love certain songs, like when they do live, where there's like this this big, big climax and then like this crescendo and then like goes into like the next movement. And they'll sometimes like just exaggerate that like pause in between the climax and the next movement. Where it's almost like, okay, boys, come on, let's let's get on the show now. Like, I get it. Like, it's it's you're hyping it all up, but that was about uh, fifteen seconds too long of a pause. No, like, I'm trying like, to get out and beat the traffic. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm like, oh my, I remember that as a kid. Like, when I would go to like sporting events with my my family, and they would always want to leave early. And I was like, why? Like, like, this is the best part, right? Like, it doesn't make sense. Like, beat the traffic, like. <laughs> who cares who cares about the traffic i know i know but those yeah. those parents like they're just trying to get some structure <laughs> all right well let's uh let's end it here um 
the podcast is ADHD AHA, the website understood.org. Are there any other uh, places where people can learn about what you do and what you're, what you do at understood.org? Um, I would just say we have a lot of different properties that all with, you know, slightly, a, a slightly different way of, of helping people who learn and think differently and supporting them. We have an app now for parents called Wonder. We've got our medium publication for by just all personal stories by people with differences like ADHD and dyslexia, of course, our website and all of our podcasts. So um, I guess the only other thing I'd give a shout out to is that we just launched a new podcast last week called Understood Explains. And the first oh, season nice. is about the special education evaluation process. <sighs> mm. The idea is we, we always hear from parents. I just wish I had somebody to walk me through, to talk me through every step of the process. So we're doing that in podcast form. That's amazing. So My background is as a school social worker. I used to, to, to hire my families to, to do that. And it's such an important piece. And it's, yeah. I always tell parents like, this is a thing that you never knew you needed to become an expert on, but it's something you need exactly. to become an expert on because it's exactly. about resources. And if you don't know what, that what you're entitled to and what you need to ask for, you're not going to get it. Yeah. And that's why we wanted to you know, kind of democratize that. Let's put it out in podcast mm. form. Let's get everybody it. access it. to it. It's great. Yeah. Laura, thank you so much for uh, spending this Friday afternoon uh, with us here and uh, for putting out great contents uh, into that podcast space. And uh, I am, um, Hopefully looking forward to coming on uh, on your show yes. and, and sharing, sharing my ADHD. Uh, I would love that. We'll get it on the calendar, Eric. Thank you. And see, I didn't need pre-written questions after all. It went fine. Right? Yeah, it went, it went <laughs> fine, even though our meds are wearing off. Like, Here we it's go. all good. <laughs> it's <laughs> really you, been a pleasure. Laura. Thank you. And thanks for everything you do, Eric. Thank you. This is Eric Tivers. Thank you for listening and congratulations for making it to the end. ADHD Rewired is more than just a podcast. We are a community focused on learning, growing, and connection. The website is ADHDrewired.com. You can find timestamped summaries and additional resources for each episode. Apply to join our free and secret Facebook community. Learn more about our award-winning intensive online video-based coaching and accountability groups. Join the Adult Study Hall virtual co-working membership community. Find all the other podcasts on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. Sign up for my email newsletter to get exclusive content that you won't hear anywhere else. And use the search tool to find episodes on specific topics. You can do all of this at ADHDrewired.com. While you're there, click on the Patreon button. If you are a regular listener, consider making a monthly contribution by becoming a patron. If you are able to financially support my work, it would mean a lot. This show is free to you, the listener, but it's not free to produce. Plus, patrons get cool perks like ad-free episodes and access to recordings of coaching calls and $25 a month patrons and join me once a month for a group coaching call. You can follow me on Twitter at Eric Tivers. You can like our Facebook page at facebook.com slash ADHD Rewired. If you're a coach, therapist, or related professional, connect with me on LinkedIn at linkedin.com slash Eric Tivers. Subscribe to ADHD Rewired on YouTube to see selective interviews and other videos I've made. Podcasts change lives. You can make a difference in someone's life by spreading the word about this podcast. Mention it in your online communities on Facebook, Twitter, Reddit, or wherever you hang out online. And be sure to share it with your friends, family, your therapists, your coaches, doctors, siblings, parents. And if you, your coach, therapist, doctor, or ADHD support group leader would like a pack of podcast postcards to hand out, you can request those at the website, ADHDrewired.com. If you are a member of Chad, Ada, or any other ADHD support group, please be sure to tell them about this show and all the shows on the ADHD Rewired Podcast Network. You can even show them how to download it on their phone. And if you really loved this particular episode, please hit share on your podcast player. I'm only one person and I do count on you to help spread this message. One of the biggest things that you can do to support this podcast and help other people discover it is to leave an honest rating and review on Apple Podcasts or any other app that supports reviews. And don't forget to hit subscribe so new episodes are automatically pushed to your favorite podcast app. Looking for more ways to listen and learn? Get a free audiobook and a 30-day free trial at Audible by going to audibletrial.com slash ADHD Rewired. Here is my list of must-listen-to audiobooks updated July 2021. Nonviolent Communication by Marshall Rosenberg, attached by Amir Levin and Rachel Heller. 
Atomic Habits by James Clear, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team by Patrick Lencioni, Crucial Conversations by Carrie Patterson, The Coaching Habit by Michael Stainer, The Body Keep Score by Bessel van der Kolk, Rest by Alex Sujong Kim Pang, The Five Second Rule by Mel Robbins, Make It Stick, The Science of Successful Learning by Peter Brown, The Productivity Project by Chris Bailey, Meditation for Fidgety Skeptics by Dan Harris, Change Your Questions, Change Your Life by Marilee G. Adams. I always recommend to my coaches and admin that they read that book. The One Thing by Gary Keller, a required reading for all of our coaching group members. Procrastinate on Purpose by Rory Baden. The Four Tendencies by Gretchen Rubin. The Art of Asking by Amanda Palmer. And if you're looking for something a little bit more magical, I have fallen in love with the Harry Potter series and the narrator, Jim Dale, is amazing. And of course, if you haven't yet boarded the Brene Brown bus, all of her stuff is great. Starting with Gifts of Imperfection, Daring Greatly, Rising Strong, and The Power of Vulnerability. And if you're an entrepreneur or leader, be sure to check out her book, Dare to Lead. Do you have something that you would like to share? Click on the podcast tab at ADHD Rewired. Click the button to be a guest at the top of the page and schedule a 15-minute interview. This is Eric Tibbers reminding you to keep learning, growing, and connecting. Self-care is not selfish. No matter what you get done or don't get done, you are still enough. And no matter how hard it feels, we can do hard things. And we don't need to do them in the hardest way possible. Thanks for listening. I'll catch you next week.